environmental and climactic changes, challenges, solutions through space technology. So for our first talk, the era of CubeSats, the technology and its applications, we have Dr. Rehan Mehmood. Um, he received his Bachelor of Engineering degree from electrical, in electrical engineering from UET Taxila in 2002 and Masters of Engineering in 2006 in satellite engineering from University of Surrey, UK. He also did his PhD from China and he joined the Institute of Space Technology in 2002 and has more than 15 years of teaching and research experience. He is the principal and small satellite technology and research lab, an affiliated lab of the National Center of GIS and Space Applications. He is also the project director of iCubeN, a 3U national CubeSat. I am going to let uh, Dr. Rehan Mahmood take over from here. Dr. Rehan. Hey, thank you. Uh, I'm here. All right. Whenever you're ready. OK, I'm ready. I'm trying to share my screen. OK, perfect. Okay, is my screen shared? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ishal, for your uh, kind introduction. Of course, you're welcome. Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody, and good afternoon. Uh, as Ishal told me that I'm Rehan Mahmoud and I am uh, responsible uh, for some of the satellite development uh, uh, in Institute of Space Technology. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, uh, I'm very excited to see the number of the participants uh, and their enthusiasm in this space summer school. Uh, in fact, uh, I was attending the last day lecture of Dr. Akib and Dr. Farooq, and I, am, uh, I was surprised that there were some very good questions uh, by the participants and the students about the wonderful talks of Dr. Akib and Dr. Farooq. And before I begin, uh, I think uh, uh, the efforts of NCGSA team and Dr. Najam uh, for arranging such a good uh, space-related activity in these COVID days are really uh, appreciable. Okay, so the topic of my talk is related to the CubeSats, as you can see on the title, and its technology and application. And I will briefly build up my presentation and talk and we'll tell you about CubeSats and uh, some of its technology, the applications, and a lot of other stuff. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you will find it uh, very uh, interesting. So let's begin. OK, here is the scope of my talk and presentation. Uh, basically, uh, this talk is limited to the overview of uh, basic build up of satellites and CubeSats. The CubeSats are in fact a very small uh, satellite and uh, I will explain the concept of CubeSats and these satellites uh, later. Uh, basic physics, physics is enough to participate in this talk and I encourage all the students and the participants to ask questions using the chat box as mentioned in the guidelines or whatever the protocol is defined by the organizers. I will try to answer uh, these questions during my presentation as well. And I hope that after listening this talk, most of the students and participants uh, will have some know-how about the CubeSats and also about uh, uh, that how to participate uh, in an educational satellite project in Pakistan. So this is the expected outcome. And I hope that uh, you will find some ways that uh, there are some good technical work related to the CubeSats and satellites are going within Pakistan. And fortunately, you can be a part of that work.
So I arranged my talk like this. Mainly, I divided my presentation in three sections. Uh, and the fourth section will be about IQBAN, uh, which I will tell you shortly. Uh, in fact, by the end of this presentation, IQBAN is basically a small CubeSat or satellite, which is being developed by the Pakistani students. And you all have a chance to participate in it. Okay, so the first section is about the background, the history, and the satellite. And then some know-how about the CubeSats and typical satellites, some of the problems that why CubeSats are evolved and related stuff. And this is followed by the application of the CubeSats. Okay, so in my opinion, uh, whenever uh, we are talking about space and the satellites, uh, the fundamental question is about uh, why to access space? Um, several years ago or 100 years ago, people are living okay without accessing space. So what's special about it? In my opinion, there may be several answers to this question. And the same happened to me when I was uh, uh, listing down those answers. But then I gave priority to that answer, which is directly related to the life on Earth. And that is the accessing space can save life on Earth. How? There are several hundred thousand of asteroids which are orbiting in our solar system. And we know that the collision of those asteroids and other such massive objects with Earth had a significant role uh, in shaping the life on Earth, like the era of dinosaurs. And these collisions in future have the potential of totally changing that life as well. So accessing space and exploring space is helping us to minimize that risk. This is a big picture. Without life, we have nothing to do with the technology and other stuff. For example, Here is an example of one of the latest mission by NASA and ESA. Didymos is an asteroid with approximately one kilometer of diameter. And obviously, it is a potential hazard or threat to Earth. A mission is recently launched by NASA and ESA to study about how to deflect that asteroid, this Didymos. The name of the mission was DART, and that spacecraft will deliberately hit the minor planet Didi Moon, which is the moon of this asteroid, and two CubeSats will monitor the impact and change in the orbit of Didi Moon. The idea is basically to get some know-how that how these collisions practically work and may be used as method for deflecting larger asteroids. And it is one of the very good example of accessing to space and even one of the very good example of the set. I will explain this mission a little bit later. In the same way, exploring space can help uh, in medical advancement in several ways. Because in space, we can encounter those radiations uh, which, are, which are not available on Earth. So whenever we develop some mitigation techniques against those radiation, it will help us in local medical advancement. And obviously, then there are several other reasons of accessing space. Maybe the possibility of life beyond Earth, collection of previous metals and elements, strategic needs, and then possession, and above all, the curiosity of human being. So we have several reasons of accessing space. But now the second big question is how to reach in space. I know most of you know about this, 
but just for the sake of completion, the majority of this answer was provided by the Newton. That if we reach to space from the surface of the Earth, then we need to overcome the gravitational pull of the Earth. And for that, we need a very large force or thrust. And then technology comes in and they provided us with the rockets. We have these vehicles, which we call rocket. This technology provided us the large force, which is required to move away from the surface of the Earth. But unfortunately, building rockets is not that simple. It requires some sort of advanced technology, and not only the technology, but some handsome amount of resources. And that's why every country has no direct access to space. This is one of the reason and bottleneck in the advancement of space technology, in my opinion. So the access to space and the vehicle which is required to access space is relatively expensive and it requires resources. And then the last question, why to launch satellite? It's okay to go into space for the betterment of life on Earth and we have the vehicle to go there, but why to launch satellite? A satellite is something which orbits a planet in very simple words. Every moon is a satellite, but most of the time we use it for artificial moon or artificial object, the word satellite. In fact, by launching satellite around Earth provides many benefits. One of the major benefits is the coverage and view of Earth. The coverage and view of the Earth provided by these satellites is not possible by any other means, like aircraft or balloon. And then we can use this huge coverage and view from the satellite for various purposes. For example, GPS satellite for navigation. We have launched satellites because these GPS satellites can provide global coverage. Not only the single satellite, but multiple satellites can provide global coverage. Weather, weather is not a local phenomenon. We need some very good coverage above the globe so that we can predict weather. And then um, ships and airplane tracking via ADS or AIS as radar, cannot provide the coverage over the oceans. There is only one choice to use satellites in those areas. One of the very famous example is the, uh, the route of the MH370 flight, which was lost in Indian Ocean in March 2014. And its last known route and location was reported by one of the satellites. And then obviously, Earth observation and the communication satellites are always in our daily life. So we are using the satellites in our daily life. So it has many advantages of launching the satellite. Apart from these advantages, the space technology provided a several spin-offs, which have been used for the betterment, betterment of the society. For example, cochlear implant, water purification, the development of the CMOS imaging sensor, which is nowadays present in any, any smartphone, in fact, every smartphone. Infrared thermometer, artificial limb, memory foam, and a lot of other spin-offs are because of the space technology. So the bottom line is that there are several reasons of accepting space. And in fact, there are several reasons of launching satellites. 
Okay, apart from all these advantages, the development of the satellites, in fact, the access to space is expensive, but now I'm talking specifically about satellites. That there are several advantages of developing and launching satellites. But the development of satellites are very expensive. In fact, very, very expensive. For example, the cost of a big satellite, it depends what we call a big satellite, like 500 kg or 1000 kg. Anyway, most of the time we determine the cost depending upon the mass of the satellite. If for example, for one kg mass, we need 1 million rupees, then for a 100 kg satellite, we need 100 million rupees. And the very big satellite, which provides uh, uh, HDTV in our homes, may cost up to several billion rupees. So the cost is very high. And it is not only the cost, but we need a lot of resources, not only the technical one, but also the trained human resource. And that is one of the reasons that IST and NCS GSA is investing on space education. We need trained human resource to access space and to develop satellites. Most of the time, this kind of trained human resource is not available in every country. And then if we, if we want to design a satellite for 10 years, then the cost of that satellite will be very, very high. As a general rule, we can say that if we increase the lifetime of the satellite by one year, we usually almost doubling the cost. And why the cost is high if the lifetime have to be increased, the batteries cannot sustain uh, for several years. There is certain limit. The solar cells of the satellite cannot sustain for 20, 30 or 40 years. And all the other electronics, which is uh, spending its time in the harsh environment of the space has to be protected from that radiation and other issues. But that protection is for a certain period of time. This all add up to the cost of the satellite. And finally, once we have the satellite, we have to launch that. But the launching process is also expensive. We may need five to 10 million rupees for launching one kg of satellite or one kg of mass into solar orbit. So the point is this whole process, which is the conventional development of the satellite is expensive and resource intensive. Obviously, if this process is very, very complex, then there must be a solution. Because of this expensive process, before this century, only big space agencies and companies are involved in the development of the satellite. And then what is the solution? One of the very typical solution, which you are thinking about that is, why not to reduce the mass and make it affordable? It is simple, but not like that. It is true that the cost and resources are usually directly proportional to the mass of the satellite. But there is a catch. If we reduce the mass of the satellite, then the lifetime or capabilities of the satellite may also be reduced. For example, if we have to put a very big telescope within the satellite, then obviously the telescope has a mass the lenses uh, may be made of uh, some plastic or uh, glass, they are bulky. So they cannot be accommodated in small satellites. So there is a possibility that there are certain constraints that we need a massive object to achieve something good. But nowadays there is a concept of reducing mass. What, why not to reduce the mass 
and launch multiple small satellites having low mass. And then these multiple small satellites can coordinate with each other to do something meaningful. So that it can do that stuff, which actually the biggest satellite was doing. But it involves a lot of research and technology. And maybe in future, we can see these kind of projects. Okay, so uh, one of such solutions was initially proposed by California Polytechnic University and Stanford University, but as an educational project. The professors there thought that since the development of the satellite is very complex, expensive, and resource in intensive, how to involve the students in this project so that we can have trained human resource. Then they thought about smaller satellites just for the education purpose. They call that satellite CubeSat. And why CubeSat? Because the volume of the satellite or the form factor is of a cubite. Initially, it was just a 10 centimeter cubite. And they call it one U or one unit. Very, very small. So they thought, why not to develop this satellite, involve students in the development of their satellite, and do all the stuff which usually engineers do on the bigger satellite, and then launch it. The human resource generated in this way can now be employed or can be used for the development of other satellite projects. But with the passage of time, the concept was so popular that these space agencies and companies started building CubeSat. Apart from one unit CubeSat, later up to 24 unit of CubeSats uh, are also specified because in one kg of mass or 1.3 kg of mass with a volume of uh, this uh, 10 centimeter cubite, it is very difficult to put some science instrument or some other commercial stuff. But just to give you an idea about the mass of the satellite or the CubeSat, you can see that the CubeSat is in the bottom. And medium or large satellites are around about 500 kgs or more than 110. So as compared to the large satellite, these small satellites are basically nano satellites or pseudo satellites, but providing most of the functionality of the bigger satellite. In fact, this kind of evolution helped the nations like us to start these kind of educational uh, satellite development project. Most of the time, these CubeSat missions, whether educational or commercial or scientific experiments, are launched in low Earth orbit. The low Earth orbit is usually specified as uh, like uh, 2,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. For example, you can see the International Space Station here. It is uh, at a height of 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. So this is a suitable orbit like 500 kilometer to 700 kilometer for the CubeSat. They can perform the required mission there and at the end of their life, uh, they can re-enter in the orbit and burn there. Since the CubeSat is very small, most of the time they share the launch with the satellite because the launcher is usually capable of carrying like 500 kg or 1000 kg to the uh, orbit. So there are several advantages of CubeSat for the purpose of research. The first one is that it's a very simple technology. Most of the time we use commercial components with a relatively high reliability to build up CubeSat. I will uh, explain this detail a little bit later. 
and then it is simpler to design. Why simple? Because the form factor is already defined and the launcher or deployer is also specified. The deployer is physically attached with the launcher. So the developer uh, need not to worry about the deployer and the form factor. And also the solar cells and the other stuff which are developed according to this form factor are available commercially very easily. The cost is low. We can build it rapidly, like within two or three years. And the advantage is the proof of concept. If somebody wants to demonstrate our technology within a year or two, the company can build up a cube set and can test the technology there. And also there is no space degree because by law, uh, the cube set uh, have to be uh, deorbit after their lifetime. Okay, next, uh, there are several advantages of using cube sets for commercial purposes. For example, one of the very basic limitation of a single big satellite is that the revisit time of the satellite is very less. What is revisit time? Revisit time can be defined as if the satellite has a camera and the satellite is taking the images of, for example, Islamabad. Once the satellite took the images of Islamabad, the satellite will again visit Islamabad after four, five, six, or seven days. It depends upon the orbit. So the revisit time or the revisit frequency is uh, high, in fact, low, because it takes certain time to again take the image of that particular space. But if we launch several cube sets with the capability of taking the Earth images instead of single large satellite, the overall revisit time will improve. And this is very important, for example, in case of some uh, uh, natural disaster, because we want to we want to take the info of that disaster uh, as early as possible and several times a day, for example. In the same way, the coverage can be increased the cube sets provides more coverage. Uh, they are more scalable. Initially, a company or an educational institute can launch a single satellite, and later on, further satellites can be teamed up with the initially launched satellite. So there are several advantages. In fact, they are fault tolerant because they are redundant. A single, if a single satellite is built, then we cannot do anything. But if we have multiple of satellites and only one satellite is created because of any reason, I think it cannot going to affect the mission that much as in the case of a single satellite. So CubeSats, developing CubeSats have several advantages. Okay, then uh, there are a lot of different subsystems are used in the development of CubeSats. In fact, most of the subsystems are typical, which are used in any satellite. And all these subsystems are found in larger satellites. But because of this less mass and less scale, it is possible for the educational institutes and research institutes and also possible for the students to practically develop these subsystems. For example, these small antenna onboard computer. It is a sort of microcontroller with some extra accessories so that this onboard computer can perform the required mission in space. The structure, the power supply. The power supply is similar to the power supply or the switching power supply, which we usually use in our daily lives uh, for the charging of the cell phones or laptop. So it is possible to develop these small satellites and cube set uh, with, uh, with sort of little support funding and with less facility.
Okay, so we have covered basically two sections that why going to space is good and why uh, CubeSats uh, are good uh, for the development and research. Now the third section is related to the application of the CubeSats because apparently it uh, seems that by reducing the mass of the satellite, maybe the capability of the satellite is also reduced. It is the case in some of the missions, but we cannot generalize. These small CubeSats have very, very good capability. And I have selected some of the missions in which these CubeSats are uh, applied and used and uh, big space agencies are using it because of the advantages which I have already mentioned in the previous slide. Okay, so the application of the cube search can be divided into several categories, but uh, I categorized into four major categories. One of the categories, technology demonstration. For example, some company or some space agency have developed some new technology and they want to demonstrate it so that they can find some suitable buyer for that. So CubeSat is the best platform to have some sort of uh, practical demonstration of that technology. With low cost and rapid development, they can uh, demonstrate their technology very well. And then scientific research, obviously related to the research institutes, educational projects, which are developed just for the sake of know-how about the satellite development, and then obviously commercial. So the CubeSat applications are divided uh, in all these categories and fields. So next I'm going to share with you some of the latest space-related applications and missions using CubeSat. Okay, the first mission I'm going to share is the Marco A and B. In fact, as, as it is evident from the name, uh, this cube set is uh, designed for the Mars or travel towards the Mars. It is one of the first interplanetary cube set. And you can uh, see the mission in the video. The basic mission is that there is a lander which is designed by NASA uh, to land on the Mars. It uh, is a stationary lander. It means it's not a rover. It's just uh, land on the surface of the Mars and will sit there. But it is carrying two cube sets with it. Once near the Mars, these two cube sets will be deployed from the inside lander. And then once the lander is on the surface of the Mars, the flyby of these two cube sets will relay the communication information from the lander to these cube sets towards the Earth. So they will just fly by above the Mars and communicate with the inside lander and will relay back that information or data towards the Earth. The problem basically is that Whenever some uh, lander or rover is uh, on Mars, it is usually very difficult to communicate with the Earth. One of the problem is the uh, propagation delay. Sometimes it may took up to it may take up to 30 minutes for the signal to arrive from Mars to the Earth. But it also depends upon the location of the lander or rover. If the lander or rover is on the other side of the Mars, which is not facing Earth, then it is not possible to communicate. So these kind of orbiters are required to relay the information from the orbiter, uh, from the lander or the rover back to the Earth. So the NASA demonstrated that even these small tube sets have the capability of relaying this much of information and with low cost. 
Okay, the next mission mission I chose is the Gomex one. In fact, it is the series Gomex one, Gomex two, three, and four. The Gomex is basically demonstrating the communication capabilities of the CubeSats. And this is one of the very interesting applications. All the commercial aircrafts carry the ADSB transmitter. In fact, in this ADSB transmitter, they broadcast the data about their position and health, every commercial aircraft. But the problem is that in ocean, in fact, in big ocean, it is not possible to pick up those signals because there is no, uh, there is no land nearby. So in this mission, the CubeSat is designed in such a way that it orbits the Earth and receive the ADSP information from the commercial airplane and relate back that data to a geostationary satellite. And then this geostationary satellite uh, is connected to the ground station. This, uh, this is the commercial aircraft, then GOMEX-1 with ADSP receiver, geostationary satellite, which relay back the data to the ground station. In this way, the real-time data of the aircraft can be reported back to the control stations without any coverage gap using tube sets. So this is one of the very interesting application, and uh, I believe that uh, in the coming years, we can see several satellites with this kind of receiver because it is very feasible to collect the location and other sensor data of the aircraft like this with low cost. Okay, the next mission is, yeah, SIMBA. The SIMBA mission is uh, about the study of the Earth climate and radiation. In fact, it is, designed to monitor the radiation of the sun as well as the radiation emitted by the earth. So it will study both the radiation emitted by sun and emitted by the earth. In fact, it will launch to space, then will go or travel towards sun and then back again to the earth. And it is designed to calculate the overall planet's energy budget so that we can predict the uh, future climate change and the other stuff which is uh, related to uh, the overall uh, climate of Earth. Simba was a three-u cube set, and then Karman mission. It is also a three-u cube set. And the objective of this mission is to demonstrate the re-entry technology. First, let me explain the re-entry. Once anything goes beyond the upper atmosphere in the orbit, then, okay, it's easy, we can go there. But if we have to re-enter the Earth, we need the same energy to re-enter Earth because the velocity of the object which is trying to re-enter in the Earth's atmosphere is very, very high. We need to break that thing. Even then, because of the friction with the Earth's atmosphere, it is likely that the entering object may be burned up or it has to face very high temperature. And this is the case with the smaller asteroids. Whenever they try to enter or hit the Earth's atmosphere, they usually get burned up. mission, they try to use some new material which can sustain that much of heat. And if uh, it is able to sustain that much of temperature, then this kind of material may be in future available at low cost, and it will help in the rapid development of the cube sets and the spacecraft. In fact, this kind of stuff is very, very expensive. Uh, uh, if you have some idea about the space shuttle, the tiles, which are the ceramic tiles, which are fitted beyond the space shuttle, STS, space transport shuttle, they are very, very expensive. And after every re-entry of the space shuttle, like 30 or 40% of the tile uh, need to be replaced. And it is a very expensive process. And this is one of the things 
which uh, led the NASA to retire the space transport shuttle and look for some of the alternative arrangements of re-entry. Okay, another mission, another application of the CubeSat is this 3D project. It is a 3U CubeSat and it is designed uh, on the basis or for passive reflectometry. The passive reflectometry basically collects those signals which are transmitted by the global navigation satellite, like GPS. These satellites are transmitting signals uh, towards the Earth, but whenever they strike the Earth, they reflect it back into the space. Obviously, the intensity is very, very low. But it is possible to design certain instruments or such low noise receivers which can collect the data and then find out the height of the surface from where these radiations are reflected from. So the PT is designed for that purpose in mind on a 3U CubeSat platform. For example, if uh, some institute in Pakistan is developing a 3U CubeSat, they can put this kind of instrument there as well. Okay, another very interesting uh, experiment uh, with CubeSat is the race project. It is also called as a double CubeSat mission. As I told you earlier that one of the method of replacing big satellites with small satellites is to choose multiple small satellites. And if we have multiple satellites, it is the possibility that these satellites uh, maybe have to travel all together or maybe have to dock in space. So this race mission is designed uh, with that kind of application in mind. These two CubeSats will fly together and then uh, they will automatically dock in orbit. So this is one of the very interesting uh, application because in space, the velocities are very, very high, like seven kilometer per second or eight kilometer per second in low Earth orbit. And uh, uh, docking at these speeds uh, are relatively difficult. Okay, then this is the mission which I talked about earlier, which is the planetary defense mission or Earth defense mission, the DART mission and the HERA mission. The DART project is basically by NASA and the HERA is by the ESA. The main goal of the DART mission is to deflect the asteroid DD mode. This is the main mission. But NASA and ESA jointly are trying to perform that mission. The DART spacecraft is designed by NASA, but ESA developed this HERA mission, which contains two CubeSats as well. The main question is to, the main idea is to uh, take the images of the impact site by HERA satellite, because it is not yet known that what is the result of that impact. Will it be will it be able to change the orbit of this DD moon or not? So one is the impactor, which is DART, and this HERA is basically take or collect that post-impact data. Initially, HERA will take the measurements of the impact site with laser and other relevant instruments, and then after a certain time. After a certain time, two 3U CubeSats will be deployed from HERA. These two CubeSats are carrying specialized equipment, and from that, they will be able to take some 3D models of this impact site. In future, once we have these models available, there is the possibility of some good information about the impact uh, on any uh, asteroid so that in future we will be able to design 
some spacecraft which will just hit the asteroid and will change the direction of that so that instead of coming towards the earth it will go into deep space but this is not as simple and you can see that a lot of mathematical modeling and the other stuff needs to be done before uh, before finalizing this uh, planetary defense mission and you can see the application of cubesat there if the this very small satellite is not there then we need to put some big satellite there which is not possible to be, to be deployed from another satellite so the less mass and the less volume of cubesat is basically uh, sometimes very very useful okay then there are several missions which are planned for the lunar exploration using cubesat and the main reason is that less cost rapid development ease of launch miniaturization of the scientific instruments these several missions some of these missions are loose sol and lumia as i told you earlier that one of any lander is landed on the uh, any planet like moon or mars then it needs some sort of orbiter so that the communication information can be relayed back towards the earth and cubesat is one of the very best candidate for relaying that information because we need to put those uh, orbiters in more numbers if the number is high in case of big satellites the cost will be also high but in case of small satellites the cost will be less okay then uh, from the uh, weather prediction or climate kind of stuff the rain cube is there it is called as the radar in the cube set it's a 6u cube set and it is developed by nasa it is a technology demonstration satellite and also it is performing this kind of experiment to collect the data about the snowfall and the rain and it is likely that in future these kind of uh, satellites uh, with cube set uh, will replace the big weather forecasting satellite okay then uh, qb50 it is a constellation of 50 cube sets international network of double or triple i mean 2u or 3u cube sets and uh, several different universities and countries are uh, developing the uh, cube sets for the, uh, the main purpose is to research the reentry and uh, the in orbit demonstration of some of the technology so the point is that uh, the world is moving towards cube sets and it has several applications and the reason is obvious less cost rapid development time miniaturization of the technology then why not to use cube sat instead of very large satellite for example currently there are i think three satellites of pakistan are active in the orbit parksat 1r parksat and uh, the rsl but these are big satellites here is a very small comparison that uh, which is about the launching of nano satellite and cubesat and you can see that with the uh, evolution of cubesat specification the launches of these small satellite increased almost exponentially For example, in 2020, the running number of CubeSat units is round about 1,200 or 1,300. It's quite a big number. And then, if you can see there, we can see the use of CubeSat launched till date. one unit of cube set it has is a 10 cm of cuboid but we can join two cuboids together to make it to you and three to make it three you so three you is three times bigger in volume as compared to one you and three you 
cube sets are the most popular one because it enjoys uh, the benefit of uh, less cost of the cube set, but also provides enough volume to do certain experimentation. So 3U cube set is the most feasible one for educational institute and the research institutes. Okay. Next, you can see the business which is revolving around CubeSat and these small satellites. Number of the companies founded, and on the horizontal axis, you can see the year. After the evolution of CubeSat standard in around 2000, you can see an exponential rise in the foundation of companies. A lot of companies related to the space business have founded. which is an indicator that a lot of business is revolving around CubeSat and a lot of commercial products and official products are now available, which are related to the CubeSat. And in the same way, you can see a lot of educational institute like universities and schools have launched the CubeSats till date. And next, I think I have some data related to, yes, you can see here. You can see in this world map that how many cube sets and nano satellites are launched by every country. And here is Pakistan. And there is written number one. At least we have one cube set which was launched by one of the institute in Pakistan. And that institute is the Institute of Space Technology. That CubeSat was named as iCube1. It was a 1U CubeSat, and it is the first and only CubeSat of Pakistan. It was launched in 2013. The main mission was educational research and technology demonstration. Several students and faculty members uh, worked on it, and uh, they developed it. Some of the components were bought off the shelf, but the majority of the work related to integration, testing, and launching was carried out in IEST. It was launched on 21st November 2013, and it was success successfully contacted uh, by uh, on the same day by some of the amateur living in the UK. Okay, then uh, Institute of Space Technology also worked on this satellite, Triple S2A. It is a 3U CubeSat. In fact, this project is from EPSCO. EPSCO is an organization of Asia Pacific countries. The main idea is to develop three satellites which will travel in constellation. One is the bigger satellite, which is in the center, and then two CubeSats. And uh, this triple S two A is the cube set uh, for which the IST team is worked on. We worked on the attitude, communication, and power system of the triple S two A cube set, and hopefully these three satellites will be launched by the end of this year. But on this satellite, we just participated. Okay, next I cube N. iCube N is the satellite which is currently under development in Pakistan. In fact, in Institute of Space Technology. And uh, the NCGSA team and SSPRL team are developing this satellite in collaboration with various universities of Pakistan. In fact, the students all over the Pakistan can participate in it. What kind of participation? Uh, as I told you earlier, that the CubeSat contains a typical system. And by system, we mean a system which provides power. If the power is there, it might be solar. So solar system is there. And uh, the students 
with some know-how of the solar system can participate in it. And next comes, for example, the battery. The batteries are the typical ones, rechargeable batteries, like lithium-ion batteries, for example. Most of the students, I, I think, uh, from higher grades, uh, have idea about how to charge or recharge battery. So one of the possibility to engage yourself or some of the student in power system, then communication. How to communicate with the satellite? Usually satellites and like IQ Ben will have a communication system to communicate with the Earth or with you. So we need to develop antenna and transmitter. And students all over the Pakistan can join us and can contribute to this satellite because we want Pakistani students to have a chance to work on this kind of space-related project. Then comes the camera, for example, which is, can be designed to take the images of the Earth, some sort of tracking software that how to track the satellite, mission control, the education, which is related to the space and satellite development. Uh, you can join NCGSA and SSTRL uh, in imparting that kind of technical education to various other students. So there are several avenues uh, on which the students can join us in the development of IQ N. Okay, that's all from my side. If you have any questions, please uh, let me know as per the protocol uh, defined by the organizer. Um, any of the students that have questions, can you turn on your mics, please? Sir, can you repeat the first part of the lecture uh, that you explained about the background of satellite? Can you explain it, explain it again? Uh, which part of the lecture? Sir, the background of satellite and uh, its working. Okay. First part. I, I, I will briefly explain that once again. Uh, basically, uh, uh, what usually we do that uh, most of the time we uh, define some motive that why we are doing this stuff. So initially I explained that uh, uh, why it is good to explore the space or why to access the space and then uh, what are the methods of reaching there. And obviously the method is rocket, but this is something very, very expensive. We have to overcome the Earth's gravitational pull and all other stuff like that. So once we are in space, uh, we have to launch some instrument there. And that instrument is basically a satellite. It can be anything which is doing something meaningful for us. We named it satellite because satellite is something which is orbiting a planet. But for us, it is an instrument. It is doing some stuff on behalf of us, or we have designed it in such a way that it can perform certain functionality. So once the satellites are there, the question is that, how to make this technology feasible for uh, all the human beings or for all the nations? Because the development of the satellite is something very, very expensive. Not only the design, but the launch is also very expensive. Since there are a lot of advantages of launching satellites in our daily life, as you can see there in your cell phone, we have the GPS, 
and uh, weather forecast. Everybody knows that, uh, for example, uh, uh, there is a monsoon spell this week. So how do we know that? Because of these meteorological satellites and other stuff. How to monitor glaciers and the communication. So satellite development and launching is very advantageous for us. But this process is expensive. So people designed or thought about that and they tried to reduce the launch cost or the development cost of the satellite. So they uh, came up with the idea of CubeSat. Initially, that idea was for educational purpose. But later, uh, this idea becomes one of the best bad for various technologies, like for uh, technology demonstration of the uh, spatial mission, um, radars, which can measure the snow and the uh, rain, and for communication purposes. So this is the evolution of the satellite part of the uh, uh, the satellite part of uh, this uh, space era. And now we are moving towards the cube set. And uh, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Uh, yes, Walikum uh, Salam. Sir, may I ask my question? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, sir, actually, I had questions uh, regarding the yesterday's lecture also, and I even emailed them. But I did not get any response. So can I ask you those questions also? That you can try to ask. Uh, if it is uh, visible, sir. I will answer. Yes. Sir, actually I had two questions rather. One was a complaint more than a question. It was that the first person to fly, it was, uh, he was, sorry. It was Abbas Ibn Pranas, it was a Muslim scientist. But yesterday in the lecture about history of airplanes, that person was not, uh, mentioned. So like uh, I had studied about the history of aeroplanes, uh, that topic before even uh, listening to the lecture. So I knew that he was the first person who flew and uh, he was inspired by the Holy uh, Quran, a verse of the Holy Quran. So there was a complaint that why wasn't he mentioned. And the second thing, the question was that, uh, so do you believe in moon landing? Because I have a uh, solid reason to believe that it wasn't true. Because when I saw the of, uh, pictures of the Apollo 11 mission from the official side of NASA, I found that the flag, the flag was waving. However, there is no atmosphere or air in uh, on moon. So how was the flag waving? Uh, okay, uh, for your first question, uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Farooq, uh, who delivered that lecture can answer better. So I will forward your complaint to him. Uh, and uh, for the second part, uh, uh, it is possible to land on moon. I think there is no uh, reason to believe that. Uh, it is not, uh, it is something which is possible. And regarding the NASA and the flag waving uh, sort of thing, uh, I cannot comment on that. But I believe that it is possible to land on moon and Mars. So maybe it is possible that at that time, uh, yes, the Apollo 11 or whatever the name of the mission was, was not landed on moon. But nowadays it is possible. So the, uh, maybe at that time, the Cold War uh, was there between USSR and USA. So maybe they have planned something, but it is, these are just a sort of uh, rumors. The only concrete thing is that it is possible to land on moon and Mars. Um, Whatever. I would request the students to stick to relevant questions, please, and stay away from conspiracy theories. Um, we'll take the next question. Thank you. Hello, sir. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Yes, sir. So you told about the satellites that we, uh, when we increase the lifetime of the satellite, it, its expense becomes double because the solar panels sort of, they are heavy and um, we can't launch them and it the expense sort of double. So um, why don't we use nuclear batteries instead of solar panels, small nuclear batteries? I mean, they're cheap and they can also 
be useful to increase the lifetime instead of solar panels? Okay, thank you for your question. In fact, it's a very good question and the relevant one. Uh, in space missions, we use nuclear batteries. For example, uh, the spacecrafts which are going beyond Mars, most of the time we use nuclear batteries. One of the reasons is that there is no other option. Anything which is going, for example, beyond Jupiter, there is no chance of getting some electrical energy from sun because the flux of the sun is there very, very low. There is no other choice. So the spacecraft like Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, which are now uh, outside this solar system and they are active, they have these kind of nuclear batteries. But for the satellites, this is not recommended. The main reason is that uh, the launch is a very risky process. If any satellite uh, carrying these kind of nuclear batteries uh, uh, is sitting on some rocket and that rocket exploded during launch or malfunctioned during launch, then this kind of radiation or this uh, kind of radiative, radioactive material may be spread over a very large area in an uncontrolled manner. So the first option is to avoid this kind of thing. And usually it is imposed by UN that not to use radioactive batteries in satellites which are near to Earth. Because in future, they have to be deorbited. And once they re-enter the atmosphere of the Earth, uh, they may become hazardous at that time. So this is the main reason. Uh, excuse me, I would like to ask a question that in the last slide you mentioned some kind of program. Uh, can we get a link or something like that so we can learn more about that? Okay. Uh, prob probably you are talking about uh, the iCube N. Okay, uh, you can uh, visit uh, this website for that, sstr.space or you can contact NCGSA or uh, Space Summer School organizers, organizers if you want to participate in it. I just repeat that this program is uh, the development, the physical development of actual CubeSat. And if any student want to participate